All right, we'll go ahead and get this thing kicked off. Um, I just want to start off by thanking everyone, welcoming everyone to our third Warner Records Town Hall discussion of You From the Front Line. Uh, our topic today is Black Women in Music, Is There a Glass Ceiling? And I am just thrilled to have such amazing, dynamic women here today to speak on this topic. Um, as you guys know, since this series began, we have had some tough conversations around equality and inclusion um, that have made us stronger, I think, as individuals and as colleagues. Uh, we've made a lot of progress, but we still have a long way to go. Um, so I've called on these amazing women here today um, to kind of just touch on uh, the vast disparities uh, around employment, financial equity, and inclusion for Black women in music. Um, and I'd like to, you know, take this time to introduce our moderator today. Um, Jessica Herndon is a great friend of mine, but an amazing journalist. Um, she's had bylines in The Hollywood Reporter, most recently the Issa Rae cover, woo -woo. <laughs> um, Billboard, People, Associated Press, and so on. She has interviewed some of the most iconic celebrities of our time, including Mariah Carey, Gabrielle Union, Diane Carroll, the list goes on and on. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it on over to Jessica to kick it off. Thank you. Um, thank you, Aisha, um, and thank you, Warner Records, for having me. Um, to the powerful women joining us today, your continued hard work, tenacity, firmness, um, and excellence in this industry where much of the C-suites and executive suites and different departments thereafter are dominated by men, um, your work is appreciated, valued, and needed. Um, you make it easier and more fun and satisfying for everyone who works with you to do what we do. Um, and you set the tone for those who follow to be creative and business savvy, socially and politically aware and great. So let me properly introduce you. <laughs> we have uh, Ms. Jana Fleischman, um, Executive <laughs> Vice President. Um, of Strategic Marketing and Business Development and Head of Communications for Rock Nation. We have Mimi Halford, Marketing and Brand Specialist. We have Nicole Johnson, Head of Urban Marketing for Pandora and Sirius XM. And we have Ms. Uh, Yvette Newell Shore, um, Co-Founder and Executive Vice President of Shore Media Group. And we have Lindsay Lanier, VP and of a and um, of Motown Records. So welcome ladies. Um, so to jump things off, um, I wanted to basically give each of you a chance to um, tell the audience who you are and uh, a bit about how you've um, been able to break the mold. So Jana, let's start with you. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you so, so much for including me and also thinking of me. And as I was joking around, this is the, the only panel that I was very, very happy to do and so grateful and honored. But uh, again, my name is Jana Fleischman, um, VP of uh, Strategic uh, Strategy and Communications here at Rock Nation. Um, that is overseeing a lot of special projects, et cetera, et cetera, um, in terms of the NFL partnership that we have, a uh, partnership with the US Open, um, the list goes on and on, everything that Rock Nation does. I like, I think the way just to cut to it of how I've been able to break the mold, or at least my own little personal mold, is. I've been afforded the opportunity to go from just one um, department and one focus. And I've just been blessed to be able to go across everything. So from publishing to negotiating contracts to actually being a manager and an agent for one of our uh, Rock Nation athletes, it's been able to be all encompassing 
And the beautiful thing is also realizing that everything that you learn in publicity turns into communications, which is no matter what strategy. So it's being able to say to people, hey, wait, I plan out strategy anyway. I can deal with digital. I can deal with marketing. I can deal with this because everything comes under the communications uh, messaging. And basically we put the story together. So we also know how to put the, the story together. Um, so I think that's the way that uh, I've been able to uh, break a mold. Amazing, thank you. Mimi, throwing it to you. Hi everyone. Um, let me just start by saying I am so humbled to be a part of this conversation and honestly amongst all you amazing women. So thank you for this. Um, I am Mimi Halford. Um, I am the founder and CEO of Creative Collaborators Incorporated. Um, it's a consulting firm specializing in brand partnerships. Um, prior to starting my company, I was the senior director of partnerships and business development at the Recording Academy, uh, working there for almost 10 years. Um, as far as how I've broken the mode, that's such a difficult question, but um, you know, for me, brand partnerships is such a niche, but um, important area in the music space. Um, I am a huge advocate uh, when it comes to helping artists generate additional revenue streams outside of record sales, and then also helping them establish their own brand identities. Um, so I've always made it a point to leverage my relationships and connect artists with brands to create you know, impactful programming or campaigns, um, yet still build uh, meaningful relationships that help to expand reach and uh, build equity um, on both sides. Um, I've worked with a variety of brands. I mean, just such amazing partners, um, such as MasterCard, Hilton, Galaxy, JBL, uh, just to name a few. And the, the beauty of it all in working with these brands is that music is a part of their DNA. So um, we've been able to create some really cool opportunities for artists. And um, it really fulfills me, honestly, to be a part of helping artists understand their value and, and build their brand in alliance with you know, a lot of these Fortune 500 organizations. Amazing, thank you, thank you. Um, next, uh, um, Nicole, throwing it to you. Hey ladies, it's um, an honor again to be on a panel with you guys. You guys look great. Um, your, your work ethic speaks for itself. Um, I'm Nicole Johnson. I'm the head of hip hop and R&B artist marketing for Pandora and Sirius XM. I've been there about three years now. I'm working in pretty much every facet of the music industry, whether that be in TV at BET, in radio, in uh, iHeart, um, and yeah, a record label, RCA. So I've definitely experienced every form of just breaking each mold, I should say. Um, I think being the first black woman in my department at Pandora uh, was really breaking the mold. Uh, when you get into tech, there's less and less of us, um, definitely for sure. So I'm just, I'm glad to be breaking the mold in that sense. Also, I'm, I'm just really proud of, cause you know, in, in music, a lot of the top 40 or pop curators tend to be of one skew. But um, I feel like at Pandora, I, I broke the mold by bringing in a woman of color to lead um, that department. And that's Tiana Lewis, who's now at Apple Music doing her thing. Um, so just different ways to show and different places that like we can be and succeed. Um, I feel like those are the ways I continue to break the mold, just bringing people up to help me break it. So amazing, loving it. Um, Yvette, on to you, Miss. Can you hear me? There you go. <laughs> okay, awesome. <laughs> I couldn't unmute. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, oh, goodness. Honored to be here. I am always uh, thrilled to be in the company of women, particularly women who look like me. Uh, I came from uh, the label side. I came into this business uh, I'm sure way before some of the people who are logged on here was even thinking about being in this business. Um, I started <laughs> my career actually as a writer. Uh, and for those who are over 30 or even over 40, I, I'm sure they grew up with Write On and Blackbeat Magazine. And I was the editor of uh, Blackbeat Magazine and uh, was perfectly fine uh, doing that. Uh, and, uh, but then my big mouth opened and I challenged someone and I ended up in this career that I did not want. I really <laughs> studied very hard to be a journalist. And I was talking about, you know, just being a hard news journalist. My, my, my whole uh, purpose at that time 
uh, was that I would go to the Middle East and I would cover these war stories and that's what I wanted to do. And then I took an internship at a news uh, paper in New York uh, and uh, that changed my mind because they put me on the they put me on the uh, crime desk and I knew that I couldn't do that. So I was thrilled to get that call uh, to come and have this interview with Blackbeat. And I spent uh, a number of years there, almost nine, almost 10 years I spent at Blackbeat. And my challenge day came when, uh, thanks to Mariah Carey, uh, and uh, I challenged uh, the head of the department then, Larry Jenkins, to send me Mariah's music. Just wanted to be a writer and uh, write the review. And uh, he said, you want a job? <laughs> I said, a job? I have a job. He said, you want a job that pays? <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, it's true. Writers back then weren't making any money. Uh, so I took that job at Columbia Records and uh, within about a three or four week, three or four day span, I'd gone from editor at a teen magazine to Mariah Carey's uh, publicist, and it changed everything for me. I spent a number of years at uh, Columbia Records, and I think that what what uh, changed for me, and what I think continues to be who I am, and how I break the mold, is that I was conscious that I was in a department that didn't have enough people that look like me or sound like me. And when I say sound like me, I'm very proud to be a Caribbean woman and there just weren't enough of us there. And when I got to Colombia, there were a lot of reggae stars, a lot of reggae stars on the roster, but not enough people that understood the culture. And so I, without saying it to anyone, purposely decided that I'm going to look for the immigrants among us. Mm. So I ended up having a department that I was running with a whole bunch of immigrant kids that just loved music. Uh, you know, because we were dealing with some major immigrants. We were dealing with the Fugees, you know? So I was like, we got to have some people that understand that. And I think, uh, you know, I still pride myself on what I call, uh, and I say it everywhere I go, uh, throwing the ladder back down. I think at some point you don't need the ladder anymore. After you have climbed very high, you need to throw the ladder back down. So every day I get up, I do my job uh, trying to figure out who is the next person that will uh, climb on that ladder. Um, obviously, I think people know that I've worked for some pretty incredible uh, artists around along the years, uh, but literally more than the artists, what I love doing the most is just trying to figure out who the next person that could sit in my seat. I'm very, very aware that we all have a lifespan. We have a lifespan that is, you know, our body and our souls, but I'm thinking about our lifespan in our work. I'm constantly thinking, I want the person that's better than me to sit in the seat. So that's, that's me. Amazing, we appreciate all of your hard work. Um, and last but not least, Lindsay. Hi, I'm Lindsay Lanier. Um, one, I wanna say thank you so much for having me as well, Aisha. It's amazing to be in conversation with all of these awesome women, some of whom I've worked with before. Um, yeah, um, so I'm the vice president of A&R at Motown Records. I started my career as a music publisher. Um, I started just, you know, always wanting to be good at something and do a good job. Um, and I worked really hard and I think for me, I think maybe the way that I've broken the mold is I've never really stopped questioning or wanting to learn. Um, you know, I always acknowledge that I don't know stuff um, or things, um, which has been really great for me because I was able to be a publisher and sign stuff super early, um, like artists like Janae Iko and Big Sean and Childish Gambino. And, you know, when I felt like maybe I wanted to learn more about the other side of the business, I started managing. Um, and then I, you know, wanted to learn what A&R was about, what labels were about, um, you know, and I'm always happy to put myself back at the beginning and just learn, you know, from the bottom up on what that part of the industry means. So I think maybe I've broken the mold that way, um, but it's been really great. Um, and I hope to continue to learn and question and try different assets and aspects of the music industry. And you absolutely will, and we're so here for it. <laughs> um, so Lindsay, I am going to direct our first question to you. Um, why are there so few female executives being represented in the music industry today? 
You know, it's interesting. Um, luckily, we got these questions in advance. Um, <laughs> so I asked um, some of my friends because I had my thoughts, but I wanted to kind of know what they felt as well. And, you know, I think a lot of it comes down to representation, um, mentorship and um, support. Um, I think if you don't see someone like you, you might not think that it's something that you can do. Um, and I think that maybe you don't think that you can be in that field or you don't even explore it, right? It doesn't seem like it's a place for you. Um, luckily for me, I've had so many um, women in my life and in my career and, and um, that have empowered me. Ethiopia has been my boss and my mentor at this point now for 15 years. Um, so I have luckily been able to be in that position. But I think, you know, before that, I never really saw me, you know? So even as a music publisher and, and doing music publishing and going into management, um, I never thought that I was an A&R until someone said to me, wow, you a and that record. And I was like, really? Um, and I didn't see myself as that because I didn't think that me did that. Um, so I think being able to have people that look like you um, is extremely important. And I think being able to have people that buy into wanting to support you and build you up, I think what Yvette said is so important, like looking back and pulling people up and having also having people who don't necessarily look like you also pull you up and be your sponsor and your support. And then also having mentors. And I think supporters and sponsors are different than mentors and we need all of them. Um, so I would say, you know, it's so important now and as there are more of us to look back and pull them up, like Yvette said, because I think it gives people the opportunity to see that they can. Totally, totally. Jana would love to know your thoughts on this as well. What just popped into my mind that I think the number one thing, I mean, this is something that's not just in the music business, it's just the world, right? And that it was originally constructed as men rule everything, they know how to do deals, they start the wars, they do all the crazy stuff, and we're supposed to be assistants, tending to them, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, this just popped into my mind. I think there's so few women because it's fear of their own mediocrity. Mm -hmm. And I say that because we have proven time and time again, those of us that have fought, 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 because it is a, a fight, there's also that beauty of having those mentors and people seeing you and seeing the opportunities and, and laying that groundwork and, and opening doors. And I've been so, I have definitely been blessed from like my first internship to have like Dawn Bridges take me under her wing. And then now being able to work with Desiree Perez, who's the CEO of a, of, you know, a company, I think the only, um, my goodness, a Latin woman to be in this position at a record company or entertainment company. And, you know, it's, but through it all, we fight so hard to get to these positions because we're that good with all the things that are trying to hold us back with all the people that think that just because of the way we look, we can't do the job before we even open our mouths and forget it if I go crazy and my Bronx accent comes out and they're really like, <laughs> oh no, she don't know what she's doing, right? But the it's like all of the obstacles, it's like climbing Mount Everest with a hundred ton rock on your back. And I think a lot of people are scared of that. And a lot of people are like, oh shoot, if she gets into a position, like, dear Lord, what's gonna happen? I'm out because I've gotten by on my mediocrity and I'm not saying everybody at all. There are amazing executives. I don't want anyone to take it the wrong way, <laughs> but people coast because they don't have to work as hard for opportunities or for any, for respect. Because I tell you, I mean, even now, you know, we work with certain partners. They see me pop up on the zoom, like, Hey, how you doing? And they're like, Oh wait, this is, this is who, is representing, this is who I'm negotiating with. I'm like, yeah, this is who you're negotiating with. It's me, right. Right. you know? So I think there's that construct and it's also just system systemic. It's like everybody, it, this is what has gone on generation to generation. So we're fighting hundreds and thousands of years, I should say, right? Of just women always being at a certain place. And at the same time, there's the false narrative that they have 
beaten into a psyche that we're supposed to fight each other. That we're supposed to fight each other for one seat at the table as opposed to saying, you know what? We got our own table. We're gonna set this up over here. You keep whatever you want, but we can do this. So it is that it, it's this whole dynamic of fighting just sexism all over the place. Then you fight the racism. And then you're fighting this idea that there's only one seat and you should be lucky to get that seat. Mm -hmm. and it's like, no, nah, I earned the seat and actually what we need to do is kick you all out. So right, yeah. that's sort of a, that's, <laughs> that's my mind frame that I go into everything every day. It's sort of like, yo, if you're doing your job all good, but you can't sit next to me just because you've been here for a while or just because you happen to be a man or just because you happen to be of whatever race, religion, black, white, purple, I don't care what it is. If you're mediocre, you cannot sit next to me. So I think a lot of people don't think about that enough as well right. or demand that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Does any, anybody else want to um, want to uh, comment, chime in on this particular? Yeah, I'll chime in uh, quickly. Um, I feel like men have been the norm for so long and women have been the exception. Um, mm -hmm. We're finally starting to cross that bridge a little bit, but I do want to take a little bit of the responsibility off the men. I'm not going to, I'm going to say us as women, we need to start to build our community and lean on each other. Like I see the guys calling each other at every label, getting the deals done directly, then, then telling the person in the department, yeah, hit up whoever, they're gonna get it done. I feel like we need to do that more with each other. Like we need to just build our community stronger, lean on each other for support and for the wins um, and not be so intimidated by each other. Cause I think we can all help each other. I mean, we can run our own label if we wanted to, to be honest, just the women on this call. So yeah, I think we just need to lean on each other more um, for sure. Yeah, yeah, no, and, and and um, and you know definitely to 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 back that um, you know I will say personally like early on in my career as a journalist at People Magazine I did a story with Yvette uh, with um, Destiny's Child a farewell tour in Seattle and I remember when the story came out um, it was back in the day when people would have like multiple bylines on things and there was somebody else's byline including mine on it and Yvette called me right away like whose name is this they were not there what's happening i just want to make sure that you are getting like this is your story you were you know making sure you're getting the prey and i just i don't know i appreciated that so much and it just spoke volumes um as to you know your character who you are who we are as women in this industry so um just that always stuck with me um and i thank you for that um okay so <laughs> next next round um what do you think the music industry is doing right now when it comes to inclusion and equality for female employees? And Yvette, I want to um, address that, that question to you first off. Well, I mean, honestly, not enough. Uh, I, I'm gonna tell you a very personal story that just still sits so badly with me. Um, let me preface it by saying, you will never hear me say anything bad about Columbia Records. It was the stomping ground I needed I learned everything about the business from Columbia Records. But it's incredulous to me that I left Columbia in 2010. And the next person of color, female, that came in with a position of authority was my friend Felicia Font in 2019. Took almost a whole decade for someone as qualified as Felicia to get that opportunity. In the middle of all of this was a sister act called Chloe and Hallie. And for five years, I basically worked that alone. Obviously with my guy, uh, Edwin, who works with me and some help from uh, another woman of color, Winnie Lamb at the label, but there wasn't like a female lead, a black woman who was at that table saying, have you guys listened to those girls? Do you see their potential? Do you see what they do in the studio? They're beyond just singers. Now there's never such a thing as just singers, 
but that they can arrange and do all these things. And not until I truly believe that Font, as I called her, because I could never say her first name right, and she laughs at me all the time with my accent. Uh, but it's not until she actually showed up that as an independent now, I felt that there was this power uh, behind everything we were doing uh, for the ladies. So I don't, it, it's just, it's not enough. And obviously now that she's there, she has the power to hire qualified people. You know, people always think that when black people get in a place, we just look for black people. That is literally a put down of us because yeah, we want, we want our table to look colorful, but you just can't be colorful. You have to be qualified. Right. So, you know, it's not that there isn't, you know, qualified people that look like us out there is that you are not looking. You're not looking beyond your little pool of people, your friend's friend and your friend's cousin and your, you know, your neighbor's son and those kinds of things. So we're not doing enough. I think um, it's a shame what is happening to internship programs. Uh, you know, I think that the labels need to uh, fatten up their budgets so that uh, HBCUs could be included in that pool of students that get the opportunity to come and learn and not just from one department. Uh, what we do at Parkwood Beyonce's company is that when an intern comes in, they're assigned to a person. They'll come in and say, I want to be a publicist. And they'll go, okay, you can be with Yvette. You could be with Yvette, but at some point I say to them, go over there and learn about video and go over here and learn what we do with, you know, with our whole charity initiatives and how do we put this digital stuff together? And it's such a small company that you're able to learn from each other. So I think we have to one, invest more in that sort of program. And when we get in, we've got to, color up the place with some <laughs> qualified people you know uh it's 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 so important to do that and and you know like nicole said you know like just among ourselves see the power in each other you know if i can't do the job i'm going to call jana and say jana who's the right person who do you know jana you know and rely not just on each other to be in the same room but to rely on the knowledge that someone has that you can get from. And for the publicists uh, listening in on this or watching us, when you have a list of names of people at different outlets, they do not belong to you. They do not belong to you. You don't own the guy at the New York Times. You don't uh, own the guy at Spotify. You don't, you don't own the guy at Billboard. You don't own Anna Winter or whoever else is at Vogue. There is nothing wrong with saying to the publicists who ask you who is the right person to give them that information because there is the internet. Eh, they can find it. They can find it. So what is wrong with you sharing it? Because the, you know people forget that. Let's take for example Essence magazine, right? There's Essence, but there is there is that person that deals with music. And of course, Corey deals with all entertainment, but then there is Charlie that deals with like lifestyle and relationships. So not everybody knows that you can go to different people. So share that information because then it's on you to build your relationship with that person and with that publication and with that outlet to help each other. So I don't think it's always about what the label or the companies in music are doing is that, what are we doing? What are we doing to push each other and to help each other? And to Yvette's point, like same with A&R publishing, share your relationships with your peers, like help build each other up. I think when we keep it to ourselves, like we're only hurting ourselves. Like again, the internet exists, so everyone share. <laughs> right. And there's something called scission, you know, you can pay a little bit of money every month and you get everybody's information. It's like, you, it's, it's like, you, it's like you become a member of the FBI. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> They got your cell phone up there sometimes. So just share the information. It's all good. Oh, I love it. Does anybody else, Nicole, Mimi, have any anything else to add on this note? 
Um, yeah, I'll, I mean, I mean, we can all acknowledge that it took the Me Too movement for this to be acknowledged. Uh, but what's going on in the music industry and the disparities that have been happening. So I guess we can thank the Me Too movement for sure, because it was calling people out um, and the Internet it was calling people out for what's happening. Um, I will say um, the music industry is having more female voices in the room mm -hmm. when they only have one female voice in the room. That's one opinion. That's like only having one black person in the room. Like we, we think differently, not everyone thinks the same. Um, so I think when you have more females in the room, it causes us like we don't have to, we don't have to, um, you know, we, we, we like when you just have more than one voice in the, uh, in the room, we're not competing with each other uh, as much. Another thing I will say, and this is more like a pop culture moment that I think the music industry is getting right and shout out to Marsha over at Atlantic, but seeing Cardi B. I love her. You, I love her. her. Rollout, <laughs> yeah, continue her rollout pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then, and I said allowing, accepting that Cardi B was gonna be pregnant, continue her rollout, put out a number one record and just demonstrated how we can keep it moving. I mean, behind the scenes and in front in the workplace. So I think that was like perfect. You know, it was a perfect uh, example. Mm -hmm. Great it. segue awesome. into this next question. Yeah, <laughs> love yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so wanna, want to, you know, discuss what, the music industry can do to um, to close the gap. So Jana, I wanted to throw that to you first off. You know what, I have been thinking about this and I don't, I, I think I'm gonna echo what everyone, what where we're going right now and continue it, that it's each of our individual responsibilities that are in a business to hire because you could have a mandate you could post memes about it. You can have a company say, yay, we're gonna do this. It really doesn't mean anything until we do take the action to actually hire people. It doesn't mean anything until we actually do take the action to provide internships. You know, so it's like, oh, what can the music industry close the gap? Industry really, music industry itself can't do anything. It's the people that make up the music industry that have to step forward and do something. You know, it's, um, uh, there are a couple of points that I was gonna elaborate on because I love them and now I can't remember them, but <laughs> that, <laughs> the main thing, oh, I'm sorry, I remember one of them. Exactly what Yvette was saying about sharing contacts. Sharing contacts, it's number one, um, showing that you can't be precious because also that security in yourself and in the work that you're doing. It doesn't matter how many people are doing something, no matter what, you should be so good at what you do that nothing is going to mess up that relationship that you're sharing. Mm -hmm. Secondly, another thing, and, and hopefully this is related to closing the gap uh, of the disparity, um, is us, like someone else said, what other folks do or the boys clubs do, they call each other. So it's like, that's something that we can do. Again, we can do the deals of, yo, you know what? I have this coming up, you, you, and you, the, the three of us, we know that the three of us are working together. And also it doesn't have to be just the music business. It's going to be one of the, the sponsors. It's gonna be a brand that needs to come in. It's going to be a DSP that's going to come in and make a, full on project and be able to bring something to life. You know, so no matter what, that's how we have to close the gap because I do believe it's, it, it is, it's our responsibility to bring people up from behind and then create what I would create the magic of bigger and just imagine bigger. Can I just jump in here and add something? Um, I just wanna say that one of the other reasons to do that is to create a force amongst ourselves. And I want to really like point out the force that Jana and I have created. And sometimes if you don't say it, no one else will. But Jana and I have had the good fortune to work for two of the most powerful people in in this music business. And we also come across the people who want to separate us. So 
particularly when we were on tour, we get all the lies, you know that, Jana, you know, they, they, they put Jana against me, they put me against Jana, and we're like, don't try it. Don't try it. Because at that point, when we have to work together, we don't even work for our clients. We work as black women. We work as executives and we have to have respect for what we do. We have a love of the craft, the narrative, the professionalism. So don't play, don't yeah. play. But if you allow a sort of opening for that, it will be there. And that's one of the things we don't do. And I don't, I'm not saying other women don't do it, but I absolutely need to see it more. And it doesn't have to be that we have clients that love each other. Right. <laughs> it's, you know, it, it, it has to be with just understanding that we, we can learn from each other. We can teach each other. I mean, I can learn a lot more from Jana now because she's got her foot in everything. But it's so important. It's so important to come together and say, this is, this is how you make it. Jana, how do I deal with this? I'm never afraid to ask a question. I'm never afraid to ask for help. I've been in this business a long time. If you pretend you know everything, it's time to go. <laughs> so right. picking up the phone, asking for help, and forming this bond is, is to me just as important as everything else in closing that gap. Yeah. And can I just say just last week, or maybe it was this week, I don't know, I picked up the phone, I was like, Yvette, you did this, this, and this before, right? Like, this is the way I'm supposed to go about this, right? Like, exactly. I'm not crazy, but it, it really is. Exactly. And, and also, once you set down a mandate that you, everyone knows that when they call, when they call you, because definitely when people call Yvette, 1000%, everyone knows you better have your stuff together. <laughs> like, don't call half ass, don't go to the left, anything. And it, it really is about saying no, there is a certain level of professionalism, preparedness, all of that that you need before you come. Love you. Yeah. Yeah. I love you too. <laughs> love the love. Um, Mimi, did you, did you want to uh, add anything to this subject? Honestly, I echo everyone's sentiments. I mean, this conversation is so refreshing. And I, look, I think it's a great question, but you know, to me, I think what the music industry can do to close the gap is listen. I mean, I think that, I think that uh, Nicole mentioned this, but it's great that, you know, the industry, you know, at large is finally, you know, starting to respect and listen to women with the Times Up and Me Too movements. But I think it's really time to listen now and understand the importance of diversity and inclusivity at all levels, you know, within the business. You know, I feel like, I've been thinking about this and I do feel a lot of organizations are jumping on this bandwagon, right? To make, you know, their company culture more diverse, you know, and inclusive, which is, you know, refreshing, but at the same time, it kind of blows my mind because it's something that really should have always been, right? So, you know, in my opinion, I do feel in a lot of these, you know, DNI roles, they're hiring, you know, minorities to come in and be the face and do the work, but they're the face for the old guard, right? And so, you know, they, they want them to problem solve, you know, this, this, this issue, but I feel it's more focused on middle management and below, not necessarily the senior levels, right? So, to me, you know, the hard truth is that all of these efforts that they're putting into d &I and you know, doesn't apply to senior leadership. So, I, and I think the music industry really needs to place a lot of attention on that. And so, you know, I do feel that they do have a lot of, of the same people in these senior leadership roles, you know, that were the problem in the first place that are still making these decisions behind closed doors um, and then pretending in public to be our allies. And, you know, I just feel the real change really has to start at the top. And so we do need, I mean, the diverse representation, you know, and voices across all organizational levels in the rooms, but sitting at these decision-making tables. So yes, Yvette and, and Jana, it's just so refreshing to hear that because it's the truth. And I mean, us as black women, going back to the earlier question, I do feel before we were set up to more so compete, you know, women in general, but then yeah. specifically women of color, you mm -hmm. know, and, and black women, because of that, we think that one seat at the table, we got to fight to get it. But, you know, I do feel just nurturing one another's strengths, sharing, mm -hmm. you know, relationships, you know, and trying to foster a better community, um, you know, as we should be for all of us. Yeah, and not only sharing each other's relationships, guys, we need our ladies, we need to start sharing our salaries. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, not so much. I don't need to know exactly what you're making, but I need to know a range. If somebody calls me and says, I have a gig at this place, this, it's a manager, it's a director, whatever. What should I ask for? Be honest. We got to tell each other because that's the only way exactly. across the board we're going to get this money. And that definitely shrinks uh, the gap. You back off that Nicole, Nicole, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. We got to talk money. We got to talk money. The guys talk money every day. Yeah, sure do. But that is our biggest problem as women. No matter how fierce we think we are, no matter how educated, the money, we got to we gotta be able to talk about money. At the very beginning of this pandemic, I got a call from two publicists I work really closely with. And they both said the same thing to me within like a 30 minute span. Oh my God, these clients want me to cut my rate. Yeah. I said, do they want you to cut your work? <laughs> right. <laughs> are, you, are you cutting your work? Because if you're cutting your work, cut your rate. But if you're not cutting your work, they either walk away and come back after this pandemic or they pay you what you deserve. Yep. And we've That's always right. been afraid to say what we deserve. It took me probably six months to sign my first contract at Sony because I didn't know what to say tell them that I thought I deserve. Mm -hmm. And I kept on working for six months telling my lawyer, no, 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 that's too much. No, 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 that's too much. That's too much. I, I, the other thing I was dealing with too is that um, guilt, you know, when you see your immigrant aunts, you know, are nurses and doctors and they're making a certain amount of money. And then you see on a piece of paper, to make a phone call to the Oprah Winfrey show, they're gonna give me what? No, 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 I could never make more money than my auntie. That's just not right, you know? So you, we gotta know our worth and we've gotta speak about it. And you gotta say, what? They're offering you a hundred grand, girl, please. With all your experience, you better listen. You tell them you gotta make 350,000 because what you really want is 250 and you know they're gonna talk you down, but don't start at a hundred because you only got 60, cut it out. But we don't have those conversations. We have to have those conversations. And I think to that point, I think we also have to realize we're not replaceable. You know, I think that to that point, we are like, we feel like we're fighting for that one seat. So we don't want to ask for too much and have them give it to the next person. And in reality, like if you're doing your job, like you're not replaceable or there's somebody else out there or you can go start your own company. Like there's so many things that we can do. And I think we have to lean on each other and realize like we all deserve that seat and we all are working hard to be there. Just all that to say, stop pitting black women in music against black against women. each other. Amen. There it is. I'm just going to say it and put it out there. I've experienced it plenty of times and I have so many sisters in this industry. It just, it like makes me, my heart smile to hear Jana and Yvette speak in the way they do about each other because it has been so hard to connect and build that community with other black women in this industry because we are put against each other so much and we do come up against the same jobs because a competitor or a brand will come to you and want you to do it for the low and when you don't they're going to go to that next black person, executive, whatever, and ask them to do it for less. And you're put in a position to where you're going to pay your bills at the end of the month, or you're going to, you know, do what you have to do. And it's not right. It's not fair. But us as Black women, we need to stop accepting it. That's right. 100%. Absolutely. Okay. So I'm um, going to move on to the next subject. Um, I'm going to throw a stat at you. So in 2019, Berkeley's women in music statistics show that 61% of women said that their careers were a factor um, uh, in their decision to have or raise children. Um, so Yvette, I want to throw this question to you um, first. You know, What advice would you give to women in the industry who, who want to you know, raise a family, start a family. You came to the right chick. <laughs> Go ahead and have them damn babies, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, listen, I'm I I came into Columbia Records with a nine-year-old son and a ten-month-old daughter. And while I was at Columbia, I had my last child. So I have three children, and I made it very clear to the executives at Columbia Records that me 
running downstairs to take that subway to go down to the West Village to see my daughter dance does not take away from the phone call that I'm going to make to GMA on behalf of Mariah Carey back then or Destiny's Child or Diana King or anything else. You have to understand that we know how to, to, to manage our time. And after you walk out of those buildings, after they decide that you are not for them more, what has happened to women, my generation and even before me, they left with nothing. They left with no stocks. They left with no savings. There was a time when everyone felt they had to keep up with everybody else and had to buy everything to look a certain way, did not save any money. There were tons and tons of female and male record executives who were living terribly, partying all the time, keeping up with the Joneses, going to all the parties, Something about children just make you don't do that crap. When you have the responsibility of another person, and it doesn't have to be two-legged children. You can invest in some four-legged children because they keep you on point too. The point is you have to decide very early in your career. If that's all you want is the career, that's fine. I love you for that. But if you also want to have a family, for me, that comes first. It comes middle and it comes last because you have to decide very early to create a life for you. My life is bigger than my career. It is absolutely bigger than my career. It, there are much more there's much more responsibility in my life outside of what I do than what I do. So doing my work every day as a publicist, as a strategist, absolutely is easier than when I had to care for my dying dad, when I had to care for my aging mom who had mental illness. And so I didn't know which mother I was going to see that day. That was more important than whether or not Destiny's Child got on the cover of Teen People magazine. And guess what? They got on the cover of Teen People <laughs> magazine. So, right. so right now, I mean, I'm older than all of you. I know it. I can tell you that I probably going to remember it one day for, oh my God, she got this and she did this for Destiny's Child and she worked for Beyonce and she did that for Prince. But there are three people here who are grown up now who I have managed to influence in the most incredible way. My son, Michael, my daughter, Mika, my daughter, Milan. And I call Milan the Sony baby because <laughs> I, I was pregnant when I was at Sony. And our son says that she's the Sony baby because mommy, you know, you had no money when you had me or a college student. You got a little bit of income when you had her, so she's spoiled. But you can have a life and have a career. You know, I tease Jana all the time because Jana has the most incredible four-legged baby, but she has a purpose. She has, she, she, she's like, I, I gotta get on this plane. I gotta figure out where, she, where, where my baby's gonna be. Like, you have to have something other than this work. And if you haven't figured that out yet in this pandemic, and I'm telling you, it doesn't have to be a child. It really doesn't have to be a child. But we all have to find something other than our work, particularly when our work is certainly as a publicist, as a communicator, it calls for you to tell someone else's narrative. It calls for you to check your ego at the door. It calls for you to be comfortable being in the background. So at what point do you recreate your life for yourself? You've got to find something that's for you. Is it knitting? Is it having babies? Is it loving on some man or some woman so much that you feel like you are the center of a romance novel? 
whatever it is, create a life so that by the time you get to doing for your clients, you are coming in full. You coming in full. And now that we are working from our closets like I am and our libraries and our living rooms, <laughs> let's create a life for yourself. As much as we love this industry, like every other career, you have an expiration date. And then what? What do you do after you're tired of this or after they're tired of you? What do you do after that? I've started sort of creating my life. You know, I've got the kids. Now I've got a grandchild. But I'm also teaching now and just trying to sort of feed into other people. Please do that, ladies. And I believe that we, Black women and brown women, I believe we can do all of those things. But if you don't want those little picaninis, like we say in the Caribbean, say mommy, mommy, mommy all the time, it's okay. <laughs> but still create something that you love. Is it going to Africa once a year and finding a village to learn something about? Is it learning to eat well? Is it your exercise? Is it deciding to read one book, um, one book a month? Do something that has nothing to do with an adjective before your name that has nothing to do with you. When they stop saying Beyonce's publicist, what will I be? What will my character be? What will they remember about me when they cannot describe me as Bouge's publicist, Beyonce's publicist, Chloe and Hallie's publicist? What will they say when the sentence starts with your name? Absolutely. That's the question you have to ask yourself. Absolutely. And that, um, you know, leads perfectly into our next subject um, about self-care. But I just want to add one thing as a, a working mother of a five-year-old, um, you know, you, we, in this, in the, in our industry, of course, we're all, we, we know we're not like working a regular kind of nine to five, like those hours, like don't apply to us, <laughs> you know, but if you can't afford extra help, if or if you've opted out of that option, right? Um, you know, you have to find time to focus, um, <laughs> which sometimes for me is not until 1 a.m. after I've put my child to bed and I've fallen asleep putting her to bed. And I have to wake up at 1 a.m. and realize, okay, I still have to make this deadline. So I have to like make this shit work. Um, and that's kind of just what it is. So it's like, you just have to accept that you're gonna have to navigate and figure out, you know, what times and when you're gonna have time and really be able to focus. Cause you know, it's, it changes after you have other beings to take care of. It just, it just does. Um, and really quick on that, I have one more, I mean, uh, I, have, I have one more comment about that because it's so important. There's a lot of young women on here um, watching. Um, companies are starting to offer the option of freezing your eggs. It's super important if you can do it, if the companies are paying for it. Companies, if you're watching, that's one thing you can do to help advance women in the workplace. So then we have a chance to have kids in our 40s and 50s if we feel like it. You know what I'm saying? Right. So I think companies providing egg freezing, IVF treatment, it's so important. Um, and it's so important that you guys do it. So if you're out there, look into your insurance uh, policies and see if you can do it. I got 15 kids in the freezer. We're chilling. Yeah, Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> Nicole, look at that. You've got all these names you can take for your daughters. Look, Jana, Jessica, Lindsay, <laughs> Yeah, you've got all these names. <laughs> but I think that what you said is so important because even as a younger executive and isn't like when I was a younger executive and working my way up, nobody says that. You know, it's always like work hard, be great so you can be an executive. Nobody talks about the fullness of your life and, you know, how you have a full life and how you look back on the memories of that. And I was a music publisher for a really long time. And when I left publishing, I realized I hadn't taken a vacation in 11 years. And my cousin was like, let's go to Italy. And we went to Italy and I was like, wow, this is so crazy not to answer an email right now because nobody ever said to me, enjoy your life. And I have since found a way to enjoy my life with work and in other ways like that. But no one, I think it's so important for people to know, like have a full life and whatever that means to right. you, go and get it. And you can have it all and balance all of it. 
but go do it because it's not going to come back for you. Never ask, never ask permission to live your life. 100%. You write all the rules, all the rules. Everybody in this house has to deal with me dancing in the closet for at least an hour before I start anything. And it goes from serious dance hall to Calypso to winding down on the ground. And let me tell you, until these knees give out, I am going to wind down on the ground forever, forever. Have your life, have your life. Uh, Jessica, there was this one point I wanted to make that just came back in my head when we were talking about the gap. I just wanted to say that we give, we give the industry and we give men who set those rules all those years ago, who read hit men and believed everything about it. We gave them permission to not only ignore us as women and as black and brown women, but we've given them permission to not realize that there is diversity among us. There is diversity in brown and black communities. Mm -hmm. So what happens is they get one and they think this is the whole picture and they expect you to speak for everyone and to react to things differently. But let, imagine if we had a girl from Ghana, a girl from Grenada where I'm from and a girl from Mississippi in the room. Wow, there's so much more you won't be able to get away with offending black people because you'll have three different perspective from the diaspora on what you can and cannot do. But sometimes when you're the only one in the room and you can't show the, 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 the narrative for everyone, they assume your silence is acceptance. But your acceptance, your silence is that I can't speak for everyone. I need my sisters in here. I don't just wanna be in a room with black women from one area. Imagine if you were in a room with black women from all over what we would bring. And as executives, a and &R executive, imagine what you will sign, what you will sign because your whole world opens up because there's the baddest chick in Ghana. There's this bad chick over here in Ethiopia. <laughs> but if we're going back to the same pool over and over, we only think that we're one thing. We're not. 100%. And I just want to add, no matter what the reaction is that comes back, never stop speaking. That's mm -hmm. right. Even if you are the only one in the room, the only way to get others in the room is to say something. That's right. If you have to have an opinion, even if they don't listen to you, there is never some more satisfaction when you say something, something goes left because they didn't listen to you and you're like this, oops, <laughs> you listen to me next time. You know what I mean? So always, and it can get discouraging. I've gotten in trouble. Aisha definitely knows. <laughs> Anybody that's worked with me at a couple of other companies definitely know that I can at times be very outspoken. But no matter what. That's why we love you. <laughs> yes. The only way that I can look myself in the mirror and get up every morning, go to work, and then go to bed with a clear conscience is that I will always say what's in my heart, what's in my soul, what I feel is right, what I feel is wrong. I didn't mess anybody over. I didn't try to take anyone's place. I'm sharing, I'm trying to bring other people up because also the way that you work in the workplace represents who you are as a human being. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of things where people forget. If you're willing to screw me over for a job, you're willing just to screw people over in life, nice. period. So I just want to say that please never, regardless of whatever feedback you get, hold true to your truth, because if they don't appreciate it, somebody else will. A hundred percent. Anna, I'd love to know, what do you do for, for self-care? What do you do for you? How, when, how do you carve out time? What does that look like? Me? Mm-hmm. Me? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're so like, what is that? No. What is that? No, you know what? Uh, I, I call a vet for therapy uh, <laughs> once in a while. Um, but, and it, it took me a long time. And, and you know what? I actually thought about this walking to work yesterday, thinking about this panel of what do I do for myself? And I can fully admit and be vulnerable and say, I'm still working on it. Mm -hmm. I'm still figuring out 
what brings me joy? Just period, because it changes so much. And there's other demons that everybody, you know, like me personally, that I, I'm dealing with. And, and all of that stuff that has nothing to do with work, but me using work as a replacement for a lot of other things. And me using work as a, as a security blanket, because I know I'm good here. You know, and I know the certain people that I have amazing, amazing relationships with, you know, and I know, I know who that is and I feel safe and secure in that, you know, so that's a, I, I can say that, but also, as she said, my fur baby, I tell you, my fur baby changed so much in me. I pick her up. She is the best dressed dog you have ever seen in your life. <laughs> ever, ever. She has TikTok. She has her Instagram. She is sassy. And it really did make me just start thinking about things outside of everything else and a little thing that could care less about who I am, what I do. They don't all of a sudden become my best friend because they want to invite to the brunch around Grammys. They don't all of a sudden want to be my best friend because they want tickets to a concert. This dog is like, where is my, tur where are my turkey tendons? And where's my, <laughs> you know, so, it is, I, I have to, uh, you know, and, and then I started taking her to the park, you know, <laughs> and just having a moment and not looking at the phone constantly. And maybe I might leave the house on the weekend without my phone. Oh my goodness. You know, and I only bring the phone in order to videotape her, you know, in order to record her. But <laughs> I will admit that I am a work in progress and I've accepted that it's okay to be a work in progress. Right, right. Um, I want to uh, begin to wrap up on on a note of, of resources. Um, um, you know, first of all, our interview hiring interns. Uh, we <laughs> we we have some you know amazing qualified candidates uh, on on here listening. Um, so if you are, let us know and let us know how they may be able to um, reach you. Um, and then also just you know, are there are there any Orgs? Are there any groups um, that you that you want to spotlight um, for people to get involved in um, and and to encourage Black young professionals? I'm going to jump in because I'm always going to take the opportunity to promote our little initiative that we have coming going called My Publicist is Black. Uh, it is uh, something I am extremely proud of. Uh, Felicia Font is involved, uh, Vanessa Anderson, uh, Erica Tucker, uh, Trell Thomas, and uh, Ernest Dukes. And it all stemmed from Ernest uh, wearing that jacket saying Beyonce's publicist is black. And we were like, this is much more than a jacket. This is really about a guy's story of not being able to get a job with the clients he wanted because he was black. And his, uh, the thing that he repeated to himself every day is that if Beyonce's publicist is black, I could do this. And so we all, we all sort of got together and we, we're, we're now like a full, full, full company, which is amazing. But we have these panels uh, frequently enough. Uh, the pandemic has uh, sort of changed the way we want to do things, but um, we have some great initiatives that we are going to announce soon that has a lot to do with students and making sure that that last year when people run out of money, uh, that we could sponsor some students to continue their education. Obviously, we want them to be studying under communications or anything, any sort of skill that would take them into this business because we really want to promote the entertainment business. Um, but yeah, that is, that is very important to me, the mentorship part, the sharing of the, uh, the outlets. <laughs> That's very important. We're going to come up with a resource guide uh, so people can know who is where in the industry, you know, when you're trying to find out who's the right person I should talk to, uh, we're trying to put that together. So my publicist is black. We do have a Instagram account and I am the crazy woman that answers pretty much every DM. Uh, so um, it's sometimes it's four o'clock in the morning, but I do answer. And then on the internship, again, the pandemic has stopped the physical need to teach someone um, and so we're hoping to resume that after uh, 2020 um, to whenever, whenever it corresponds with the start of a semester, 
is when we take students because it works with the school year. And I'm talking about uh, Parkwood, Parkwood Entertainment. We do have interns. It's been on hold. I will find out when we resume, but it's a very, very important uh, step in the right direction. It is a paid internship. We do not believe that interns should just go get your coffee. Uh, so we believe in teaching them well and also making sure they get a little something in their pockets. So uh, I'm sure we will announce that uh, through Be Good uh, once we resume that. But please check out, you know, my publicist is black and my publicist could be gay, my publicist could be brown, my publicist could be everything. But my publicist is other, is really what we're about. <laughs> right, right. Nicole, do you have any resources? Um, well, shout out to Heather uh, Lowry at uh, Feminine Forward and Live Nation. I was just accepted to that mentorship program. Yes. I think there's accepting applications, or they are accepting applications until April 2021. So I think that's a great opportunity for a lot of young Black executives to get in the door for sure. And clearly uh, Women in Music is a great uh, organization. Um, and there's things like that that you can definitely look into. Okay, Jana? Um, we've really been focusing on, well, I was focusing on just the internship program, which is on hold right now because of the pandemic. However, we're gonna figure out what we're doing in 2021. Mm -hmm. Also, we are in the process of really building up what our partnership is going to be with LIU um, and what happens with those scholarships and those opportunities there. So we're in the process of building that up, going to figure out if there's going to be a summer program or if we're going to launch everything in 2021, I mean, fall 2021. Nice, nice. And Lindy? Um, yeah, uh, Femit Forward, Women in Music um, are great organizations. Um, I also am happy to speak to anyone if they want to um, reach out to me directly. Um, and then UMG does have internships, um, and we also have one specifically focused um, on HBCUs as well. Yay, that's awesome. Perfect. And if somebody wants to reach out to you directly, what would be the uh, You can email me. It is uh, Lindsay Lanier. <laughs> Lindsay.lanier at umusic.com, uh, EY just in case you're wondering. Um, so yeah, please email me. I'm happy to talk to anyone and help in any way that I can. Perfect, awesome. Anybody else wanted to throw yeah. anything else out? Um, you know, just so everyone knows, Warner Records also has a virtual internship starting uh, spring of 2021. So you guys can check for that online. We are definitely looking to have amazing qualified interns of color as well as everyone, but feel free to check that out. And people can always reach out to me directly to my infos out there online as well. Um, you know, if they have any additional questions, but I encourage everyone to, you know, check into the resources and also, you know, really just look at how to build your own community. Like I was blessed to have Jana as my mentor all these years interned under her. She's watched me grow and develop and I can always call her, um, you know, with a question or it just to vent. And I think that's so important. And it's something that we need more of. I want to, you know, start something for younger people to be able to come to our group because, you know, we, we're all smart, talented women who can lend our time and so that's something i'm gonna work on and try to build up more of next year but you know you can reach out to us where we're around and you know we we respond hit us up and i just add one more thing i just want to thank everyone that's actually that's watching um and just all the comments and and i'm overwhelmed and <laughs> appreciate everyone's time absolutely um all right, ladies. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This has been amazing, um, so fulfilling um, and uh, inspiring. So thank you for for taking the time out of your busy, busy work schedules to to build. Um, appreciate you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank Great you. conversation. Thank you, ladies. Thank you guys all so much. Yeah.
Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.